So one of the most important tools we have in chemistry is the periodic table. It is a work of genius. It's taken for granted so often because you see it on every wall in every science classroom and everybody kind of knows that that's where the elements are. And, but to really understand the genius of this table, and it's going to take us a while to get there, uh, you have to understand a little bit about how it came about. So we want to kind of go back in history a little bit to talk about some of the work that led to the table as we now know it. There were many chemists and physicists that decided to try to arrange the elements that were known at that point in time uh, into some kind of order. And many of them had the idea that they could arrange elements based on their properties. As a matter of fact, there was a, a central idea that the elements, their properties, would sort of allow the elements to be grouped into very regular uh, sized groups. And uh, Newlands was the first to come up with a way of doing that. He theorized that the properties of the elements seem to repeat every eight elements or so. And knowing about music, as Newlands did, he related this to the notes on a piano, that every eight keys, white keys, creates something called an octave. That's what octave means. It means eight. And so Newlands thought that the elements would arrange themselves into these groups of eight. He seemed to see that there were some patterns in the properties of these elements. Well, the problem was that uh, it didn't exactly work out perfectly well. And uh, the octaves that Newlands thought he was able to arrange the elements in, well, they weren't exactly well arranged. Uh, and you can see that the elements seem to appear in rows of eight, but uh, but they're not. They weren't really. There wasn't really any hard and fast rules that held them there. Uh, another scientist at the time, De Bruyne, believed that you could group elements into groups of three, based on similar properties. He grouped together elements like lithium, sodium, and potassium, which are all very similar in their physical properties and their chemical properties, but uh, while it was a neat idea, it didn't fit all of the known elements. There were some that didn't seem to fit into groups of three, and then there were some that seemed to fit with groups of elements that already had three in them. So that didn't work either. It took a chemistry professor uh, named Dmitry Mendeleev to really do the master work that led to the periodic table the way we know it. Mendeleev was Russian, and he was a very dedicated and diligent worker. And he started by arranging the 63 known elements at the time by their atomic weight. It had recently been possible to determine the atomic weight of an element, and there's a process of doing that based on relative amounts. Not really important right now, but uh, Men Mendeleev was able to uh, get the information that he need and he in one version of the story he wrote all of the information about each of the 63 elements onto 63 cards and then he kind of started started to arrange them and sort them out and finally when he had an order that he liked he, he wrote it down on a piece of paper it looks kind of like this what was interesting about Mendeleev's work was it wasn't perfect but he did something that the other predecessors never did he left spaces in his list, in his chart, for what he believed were elements that hadn't yet been discovered. The other researchers, the other scientists, believed that they knew everything about the periodic table and that they knew all of the elements. And so when the law of octaves or the triads didn't work out, they didn't know what to do. Mendeleev, when his chart didn't seem to follow a particular pattern or there was a break in the pattern, Mendeleev just assumed that there was an element or two that we didn't know yet, we hadn't discovered, and so he left a space. More importantly, 
based on the patterns that he was able to witness when he arranged his elements by atomic weight, he was able to predict the products, or the properties, he was able to predict the properties of these elements that didn't exist yet. And when they were finally discovered, his predictions were very, very accurate. So it took one more little additional piece by a scientist by the name of Henry Moseley. Henry Moseley was a physicist, brilliant British physicist. And one of his contributions to physics and chemistry was the an understanding of what's called the atomic number. Moseley was the guy who decided that the atomic number was going to equal the number of protons in one atom of a particular element. It's the atomic number that gives that element its identity because no two elements share the same number of protons. Moseley took Mendeleev's work and making just a few adjustments he, adjust, he arranged the elements by order of atomic number instead of atomic weight and when he did that the modern table that we're so familiar with began to take shape. Now at the time when Mosley did his work there were less than 70 elements. We now know of 118 of them. But the patterns that Mosley set up allowed us to continue to construct the table into its modern form. Now there are some things about the table that we need to become familiar with, some ways of getting around. The first is that we don't call them rows or columns. We call the rows periods, hence the name periodic table, and that has to do with something called the periodic law, which we'll study later. We call the columns groups or families. And just like members of a group or family share something in common, the elements in a particular group or family share something in common. Since we arrange the elements by atomic number, we are also able to see patterns in their properties. And that allows us to group elements together in a more useful way. So taking a look at the common modern periodic table, this one is, uh, is missing elements 110 through 118, but we don't know a lot about those elements yet. And so it's really not a big deal that those aren't there because the most important parts of the periodic table are here. The first thing we want to understand is that this represents all of the, the chemical elements, substances that are made of one kind of atom. And we can loosely separate these into two general categories, metals and nonmetals. About 80% of all of the elements known are metals. They're all positioned over here on the left side of the table. The boundary is this staircase shaped line just over here on the right. That's the boundary between the metals on the left and the nonmetals on the right. Now there's also a special group of elements along the stairs right along that line that are neither metals nor nonmetals. They're called semi-metals or metalloids and we'll talk about them later. Now of the metals we have this group in the middle these elements, these metals, are called transition metals. And they are perhaps among the most interesting elements on the periodic table. Most of the elements, the way they're arranged, allow us to develop some rules to determine their behavior. The transition metals tend to break those rules. The other elements, the ones in the tall columns, are called main group elements. Sometimes they're called the standard elements or sometimes they're called the representative elements. We'll call them main group elements. And those contain examples of every chemical and physical property that you can think of. They're found in those tall groups, those tall columns, the representative or main group elements. There are four groups, four families on the periodic table that I need you to be very aware of. They have special names because they're so commonly found in compounds. You'll notice that the groups on this particular table are numbered from 1 to 18 across the top of each of the groups. 
That's the uh, modern way of numbering the families. There are other ways of doing it. And depending on the periodic table you look at, you might see the numbers 1 through 18. You usually will. But you might also see some Roman numerals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, um, and letters A and B that go with those. And that's the sort of old-fashioned way of numbering the families. We're going to focus on numbering them from 1 to 18. And the first family that you need to be aware of is over here, group number one, the extreme left of the periodic table, not really including hydrogen, even though hydrogen appears to be there. Um, hydrogen kind of floats back and forth from one side to the other as, ne as needed by its properties. But I'm talking about these, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Those elements are called the alkali metals. And they are uh, very reactive, the most reactive metals on the periodic table are the alkali metals. Immediately next to them in group 2, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. Those are called the alkaline earth metals. And we find them, oddly enough, in biology quite a bit. Magnesium, calcium especially, are uh, very important metals in biology. Uh, barium and radium are used biologically, but they're not normally found in, in large amounts in the living things. Now we're going to jump all the way over to the opposite side of the table and we're going to look at these elements here, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are called halogens. Now, the word halogen comes from two words, halo, which means salt, and gen, which means maker. So the, the halogens are the salt makers, and we already know that common table salt contains one of them, chloride. Finally, we have group 18, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. And those are called the noble gases. And they don't react. They're called noble because they don't mix with the common elements. They tend to be unreactive. Those are the four most common families, but there are other families that we're going to see uh, elements in that are very uh, reactive and that will form compounds that are fairly common. Uh, finally, down here at the bottom, we have these two co uh, rows down here called the lanthanide series. That's numbers 57 through 70. And the actinides, numbers 89 through 102. Together, this whole group of two rows are called the inner transition metals, uh, or the rare earth elements. And they are very odd elements by the way they behave. But what's important about them is the reason that they're separated like this. Uh, you'll notice that where they belong is between numbers 56 and 71, barium and lutetium, and numbers 88 and 103, radium and lawrencium. Um, if we were to put them in there, then this table would be about twice as wide as it is right now. Some enterprising printer back in the uh, 18th cent 19th century or so decided that they could save money and paper by just putting those two below and showing with, by means of an arrow where they belong. So. You want to become familiar with the different terminology involved in the, around the periodic table, being able to find things uh, along around the periodic table, knowing, for example, where the alkali metals are, the halogens, uh, so that we can start to talk about these elements and their properties.